So this is not the 20th anniversary of Dead Eye Dick. This is the 20th anniversary, the 20th birthday of Mary Moon, right? Well, not really. Not really? It's, next year, July 14th, will be the 20th anniversary. 1990, July 14th, 1994 is the day New Age Girl hit the radio officially. Okay. May 19th, 1994, we got signed. We signed our record deal. So here we are six months before that. Basically, we were talking about a 20-year thing for, ni- for 2014 coming up, and our manager is a little bit impatient. <laughs> <laughs> and he found a date. Basically, he found a date. Howlin' Wolf was excited about it. We all, I think, got excited about it once there was a date. So we're calling and it 20-ish? 20-ish. 20-ish, 20-ish. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's between the momentous events of recording the record in late 1992 and finally, two years, not quite two years, uh, you yeah. know, a, a year and a half later, getting signed with that little $2,300 record. So, so th- the album that eventually came out, A Different Story, was recorded two years before it was put out. October, Almost, yeah. October 10th through 13th, 1992. Okay. And then we, no, sorry, 2nd through 6th, and then we went on the road with yeah. Billy on the 10th. So that cassette that I remember floating around was, was just tracked excerpted from it. Yeah. Okay. With the target. Okay. All right. Well, let's go. Dave Gidry. <laughs> that was David. David Gidry did that. He's going to be there tomorrow night. Awesome. Well, funny little story. After Katrina, I drove to the parish and went to uh, Lou Carolla's house. Mm-hmm. And right, out, right outside his, his back door was that cassette. You're kidding. Just sitting there like it had floated out. Holy and that's cow. where it landed. Satan was expunging the house and <laughs> kicked it out. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it up and looked at it, and I mean, it was ruined. But wow! I put it back down, but yeah, that's pretty. It was that the one was with funny. the target on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, I think we homemade those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, David Gidry did the artwork. That's right. We, I think we paid a dupe company like in Mid City to that's make right. like a two hundred or because they were the clear cassettes, and we the were clear so cassettes. impressed. Yeah, <laughs> because they weren't the, the very white cheap for right, nineteen ninety two or the TDX SR ninety. They weren't mm-hmm. those. You yeah. know, they're actually well. His his. Piano floated around inside the house and ended up on his pool table, but the Dead Eye Dick wow. cassette escaped the house. <laughs> One of the few times Dead Eye Dick has escaped anything. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back a couple of years before um, how did Dead Eye Dick come together? Well, Mark and I met first. Um, I was playing in a band 
called Misfit Toys. It was my second originals band. And Jet Screamer was original. Jet Screamer yeah. was my first um and that's where I first met, like, you know, the guys in Fresh Young Minds and Odd Fellows Rest and stuff like that. But we weren't happy with our bass player at the time. And then I was working with a gal at a retail job, and she had a crush on Mark. And we were working very close to where he, he managed the PJs, the original PJs on Maple Street. And she said, go, go look and tell me what you think. Then did, she did and a girlfriend... The, did he have the mullet then? No, he had beautiful yeah, hair was, and a tight was ponytail. Free. He was, he was, he, you know what he looked like? He looked like one of the handsome thugs in like a 1980s Stallone movie where he's like, would, would have been wearing like the, the, the wide shouldered suit. <laughs> And it, it, was, die hard. it was real thick, Strip slick back that. hair and a little bun. Oh, I've rocked it. Yeah, he, rocked he, he looked it. tough. He looked very cool. <laughs> but then, you know, so I said, oh, I, I went and got a coffee. He happened to be working and, I'm, you know, just chatted amiably, like didn't give on that I was, you know, scouting for a friend. Then she and her girlfriend went and saw him play with somebody. Who's, I forget even, I don't even know who it was, but he played some funk gig. And they said, this guy is a great bass player. So then the next time I said, I said man, I heard you play bass. I gave him a cassette, like a, a demo tape that Misfit Toys had done, I think like at Studio 13 in the Maison Blanche building. Hmm. Now the Ritz Carlton. That's right. That's where it was. Um, and he responded. He liked it. So then we asked him to come audition and the, the then bass player walked in on the audition. And it's like the only time I've been caught in bed with the other <laughs> woman was like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm playing his rig, his bass rig. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, insult well, to and, and the, the, the side note, the opposite perspective of that story is, <clears throat> I'll, I'll adjust two things. One, he gave me the tape, <laughs> and it, no kidding, it absolutely blew my mind. And three of the songs that we play tomorrow are were on that cassette. I think there were three on the, four on the front, right? I can't even remember. Yeah, yeah, three or but four. But second story was in the show. drag. Second story, um, and a couple other ones were on there, and. I was an, I was an original funk band with a bunch of guys, in, um, including Russell Batiste, that I didn't know who Russell Batiste was. In fact, after our first gig, I went up. I was like, "Man, you know, you're pretty good. Do you play around a lot?" And he goes, "You know, I play a little." <laughs> and then the first show we played was like at the Corporation, and this guy walks up and he, he was like, "Hey, man, would you mind if this guy plays your bass for a couple songs?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And so I handed him my bass, and I'm, uh, he plays a couple songs. And afterwards, I was like, "Man," I was like. Oh, Shit, you're awesome. And he goes, thanks, man. And he, I remember, I'll never forget, he looked at me and goes, you're a motherfucker of a bass player. And I was like, wow. I was like, do you play around a lot? And he goes, yeah, I play a little. Well, that's George Porter. <laughs> <laughs> and then Russell Batiste of the Meters is, the, is our drummer. <laughs> so welcome to New Orleans, white boy. You know? <laughs> yeah. And right about that time, you gave me the tape. Anyway, that tape blew my mind because I'd never heard original pop music that was written by people I knew. Because... Where I grew up, it was cover bands, and where I went to college, it was cover bands. I'd been in bands for years. But on the back of that tape that he gave me was um, a really kind of a horrible recording version of an oversaturated guitar is kind of distorted, but this song. And he, didn't, and he didn't tell me about that song. So I learned the first four songs and went and played, and like you said, the bass player walked in. But I was so in love with those songs, I flipped it over, and there was a song, and it was... I remember you told me it was on your Tascam 8-track, which you called your 7-track, because one track was broken. <laughs> and it was like seven tracks of overdriven guitar. No and, drums. And then no drums, and then some vocals. And the song was New Age Girl. And I said, dude, what is this? And he goes, oh, no, no, no. He said, that's some trash. It's some crap that I threw away. I was like, this song is even better than the first four that you gave me, which I fell in love with. And, you know... That's when I, to be honest, I was the guy getting the good deal because I was getting in to a band with a guy who was writing songs like that. And it blew my mind. It really did. I'd never been in an original band, really. I was in a blues band, but you know, how many times can you play one, four, five? Mm -hmm. Great musicians, but that wasn't really my idea of writing songs. It was just jamming. So when I got that tape, it really it literally changed everything for me. It was awesome. And it changed everything for me, too, because. I had had I had started playing in co actively in cover bands in the early '80s, and I, I developed a really great rapport with the lead singer, who is an amazing drummer. This guy George Prentice, who still plays music, he's like a big federal clerk of court, like one of the top ones in the country. But he's an amazing singer songwriter. He plays every instrument. He's still one of the best drummers I've ever met in my life. But he didn't want to be a drummer because he'd play gigs, sing and lead, playing amazing drums, doing like well, you know Who songs and Beatles songs and whatever. 
blowing people, but nobody would recognize him because he was a drummer. <laughs> so he said, fuck that. I'm not going to play drums anymore. I'm going to be a front man. He and I had a great rapport. But once I start, finally started an original band, when I started Jet Screamer, I never wanted to be a lead singer. I finally just gave up because I couldn't find anybody who wanted to sing my songs. But before I met Mark, I had never had that similar kind of really just solid rapport with another musician playing originals music the way I had had with George and our, origin, our cover bands that were so good and tight. Playing with Mark, all of a sudden, it's like we were very simpatico. Like we were both musically, we we're like, he'd say, oh, do you like this? It's like, oh, I love that. You know, he said, you like police? I love the police or whatever. You too. We love, we love so many of the same bands, Jackson 5, whatever. And I know this, this can sound like really corny, but we were also like the guys who still really loved our parents and liked our parents, got along with people. We weren't, we weren't dark guys. We were like, life's great. We're lucky guys. You know, what is there to be angsty about? You know, we, right. so we really clicked on the personal level too. We liked hanging out together. So that was really nice. Um, and I wasn't a songwriter when I met Caleb. I was a bass player and, to be honest, a very mediocre one. <laughs> I mean, I could get through it. I really could. And still, to be honest, I would, like if Thomas McDonald walked in, I would hide my basses and say, <laughs> I'm a guitar player, I'm a rhythm guitar player. You know, but I know enough being in New Orleans not to go walk around with bass player written on my shirt because you have to be the shit. And I know right. I'm not the shit. I've never wanted to be the shit. But this band was perfect for me. And my point was, I wasn't a songwriter. And when I heard what Caleb was writing, I mean, he probably gave me over the next six months after that first tape, I mean, I was just like pumping him for stuff. You probably gave me 50 songs and I learned every one of them. And they just blew me away. I remember I had this little JVC one speaker cassette player and I would sit in my bathroom because I was living with like 17 people in this house <laughs> the house and I would just obsess over these songs because they and it was just acoustic most of the time. It was just acoustic and him vocally. But I'd never heard someone be so unique and creative. And it, it, it really, it blew my mind. And I would learn every single song that he gave me and they were awesome. And I told you, I think I told you, I found at the, I was cleaning out my attic the other day and at the bottom of a box, once we were, we were doing some reunion stuff, I was looking for like old photographs and whatever. And I found this black three ring binder of all the handwritten chord charts with the song titles from that period that he had given me. And I had this book of probably like 75 or 100 songs, probably 20 of which... No, for 15 of which we still play. Or, you know? or we're definitely playing. Yeah, you yeah. Made the third on release record. And yeah, like. exactly. So, But I found that thing and I started flipping through it and I was like, it, the catalog of this guy's songs before, I, in the period before we wrote the first album was mesmerizing. And, and that's what really, I wasn't a songwriter and I wanted to be one. And I started watching him play guitar. I learned guitar chords from him. I learned song structure from here, from him. I was a biggest music fan you can find, you know, not unlike yourself. I would listen to anything and everything. And I was a radio kid growing up, but I'd never written a song. And I'm watching this guy. I'm just going, holy shit. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to go. And this is the guy I want to lead. And it was it was the best decision I'd ever made, you know, just to, to drop everything else and, and get on board with it. So, But... You know, he might say he wasn't a songwriter because he hadn't been yet. But Mark, and he, he likes to put down his bass playing, but he, was, he had a musicality that other good, solid bass players I'd played with, really good bass players in some cases, didn't have. Because he'd hear songs that I wrote, and he wasn't just like learning, okay, I'm just going to play the root notes and occasional fifths. There's some songs like- I was destroying them. <laughs> there, there, there's a, one, a really perfect example, even though we're not playing at the reunion because it's really slow, we wanted to keep it upbeat. But on the first record is a real torchy, inspired by Rogers and Hart kind of song called Anyone. And I have never played that song by myself because it is crap without his bass player that he carefully wrote this beautiful, musical, contrapuntal and harmonically interesting bass line that makes that song from like a pretty little ditty to something really special. And he always had that. He'd come in and he'd like us, he'd really like a song that I gave him and he wouldn't just be satisfied to play along he would compose a bass part that made that song much better. And I think that's the other reason why we just locked in together because we would go play Acoustic Night at Helen Wolf almost every Monday back then, mostly for self-promotion, but also if we had a new song, whether Billy was in the band yet or before Billy, 
when we had another drummer, we'd often try them out together because we'd learn them and then bring them. You know, Mark would come up with a bass player part, and then we come to the drummer or Billy mm -hmm. and say, "What do you think of this song?" And we play together. We, we never miss an acoustic night. That was amazing. I know. If if we were in town, you know, even after we started going on the road, usually on Monday night we're not playing mm -hmm. anywhere. Right. So we're at home, and it's like, "Hey, see you there." And two guys who don't drink, it was a cheap night. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What That's was true. the question? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, there's no pro no problem with uh, <laughs> with explication. <yeah. laughs> wondered about the label you guys signed to. Because, so did we. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I, I know that uh, with the radio play that New Age Girl was getting that multiple labels, most of them much bigger than Ichiban was, was trying to sign you guys up. And I mean, Ichiban was known for other types of music. like yeah. uh, Mostly blues and some rap. Right. So, and they were the legendary folks who released Vanilla Ice and sold them to SBK Records in Dallas right before he sold 15 million records. That was a good business move. Yeah. We'll yeah. get to that. This is, that's going to answer your next question. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> why, why did it end up being Ichiban and not one of the majors? When 99X got the song in Atlanta, they played it on Monday and, or Tuesday, and then Thursday was number one. That changed everything for us because then New York started playing the Chicago. So we actually had a number one song with no record deal. That's the short story. So when we got to Atlanta to open for Mel and the Party Hats in Atlanta, 
And we had a sorority gig too. That's right. That's right. And then Steven, our manager, was based in Atlanta. And we got there and literally he had every major label and every independent label with an offer on the table. And the beautiful thing we had was a number one song that was going out of control. The problem is every major label, their number one rule was pull the song, put the band in the studio, make another record, re-record the record, and we'll release it. Um, we all felt like it was twofold. One, you never, you got lightning in a bottle. You don't, you don't, you don't pull momentum, it. No. You will never know if you get it back. You know, even if you re-record the song better, it may be like, oh, they already released it, and you know. So anyway, that was number one. We didn't want to do that. Second thing was Ichiban and the other independents were the only one who could get the record on the shelves in six weeks, and that's the time we had by 99X standards. They said we will play your song for six weeks without a record on the shelves. But in that time, that is our standard promotion for an album release. If you can't have anything on the shelves, we have to drop the song. So really, in a nutshell, Ichiban had the greatest college uh, promotion guy in the country working for them. And we wanted to be a, a huge college band, you know? And they could, they could put the record out quickly. And, you know, it was very simple and they were behind it. I mean, I think our model, I think at least, you know, as far as I think Mark and I and Billy all agreed, we probably as a career, if we were going to imitate a band, lots of people say, oh, they want to be the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or U2, but I think we wanted to be REM career-wise. You become a, a critic and college darling. Mm -hmm. Those are fans who grow with you and love yeah. you and fetishize you and stay with you. And then you slowly get bigger until you become a big pop band. But this this sort of changed everything because that song just ran away and made us a big pop band, you know, right. and got us into the top 20. And Twice. that, yeah, and that, <laughs> that was what really, I think, skewed our career for both much better and for maybe ultimately in the long run worse. But I, you know, I think when things weren't working out the way we'd hoped they'd work out, we might have you know, thought of all sorts of things we could have done or should have done differently. But Mark has said, and I, I now agree with him, that with the information we had, we made the right decision for the time. And I think had we made another decision, who knows if we would have even had the ride that we got to have. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, I mean, really, even thinking now, knowing what we know, and obviously hindsight is twenty twenty, is fantastic. Let's just say for sake of argument, we would have changed everything. I don't think we would have, but let's say we would. You still can't convince me today to pull a song from the radio when it's number one. I just don't know. You you spend your entire career trying to get that. And then it's there. It's like, no, you know what? Let's re-record it, put out a different album on a different label, and then we'll re-release it. I just, I don't have that much confidence in lightning hitting the same spot. Yeah, I mean, if, if maybe if, if one of the big labels would have said, we'll leave New Age Girl on the road, we'll get a single out into the stores in six weeks. Right. In the meantime, you guys are going to go in the studio and re-record your record, maybe even see, see what other songs you have and make yeah. um, what they would consider a more releasable record. Because the story is, you know, we did take three days and 2300 bucks to make our first record. And in many ways, you know, as we matured as musicians, we could say, oh, you know, the songs are all so fast. You know, Billy had been in the band for less than two weeks. He, you know, Mark was cueing him the whole time. like <laughs> On the other side of the window, yeah. literally. Um, and the only reason he didn't play on Molly, drums on Molly, is because he, he had heard never heard the song. Yeah. And we were in the studio, and that was one of my favorite songs. I was like, Caleb, while we're here, let's just do Molly Acoustic, and we'll do whatever with it later. Yeah. And <laughs> Billy had never heard it. So that's how new Billy was. But we'll get to that. Absolutely critical to the success of this band. We never would have been who we were or gotten to where we were without Billy. There's no story Never without would have Billy happened. Yeah. yeah. Never absolutely. would have happened. We... He the, was the perfect moment yeah. and the perfect drummer and the perfect energy and the perfect timing and everything. It was great. The way I always try to explain it to people is that prior to Billy, the drummer who preceded Billy, very talented guy with really good chops. But when we play gigs, I really started to get, despite Mark's confidence in me, I started getting down on myself because I was thinking, my songs just don't sound good. They're so hard to play. Like I'm just trying to write pop songs, but these songs seem so hard to play. And then another friend of ours, because I'm very good friends with Mark McNabb, Travis McNabb's older brother. Travis McNabb is, has been in signed bands since he graduated high school. He's visiting his brother. 
he jumps on the the acoustic night stage with us, having never heard our music, but not knowing our songs. Never heard the song. The Cowboy Mife guys happened to be there, and Fred LeBlanc walked up and said, that's the best Dead Eye Dick gig I've ever heard. The three songs we played with Travis that he had never heard before. And it became apparent that we we just had the wrong drummer. He's not a bad drummer. He was the wrong drummer. Right. Because he even said, I'm going to alter my style to fit you guys. And even when he said he simplified... him. Yeah. When he simplified... Um, his style. Let me call you right back. <laughs> Talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, he, when he simplified his style, it still didn't work. Billy sits in and re- auditions us while we're auditioning him, mm-hmm. and it's amazing. Just from the first song. The just first like song. Travis. It sounds so good. My songs are now not hard to play. They're actually easy to play. You know, like there's a groove and. The lock that Mark and I had at Acoustic Nights is now completed. You know, the triangle is complete. Because that was the funny thing. After our other drummer left the band, and it was his choice to leave the band. It just wasn't working. Cale and I kept playing. We weren't just like, oh, well, there's a band. We actually went on the road more as an acoustic duo with Cowboy Math and with some other things playing. And to be honest, we were tighter than shit. I mean, the two of us were just locked in. We were locked in. And that's why... The people who continued to support us and, and help with the recording, like like Fred and Paul and all and, and Griff and all these guys, w- they would let us open for them because we rocked the house as an acoustic duo, you know, and, and that was fun. So when we found Billy, and I remember when Billy came over, I was living on half of a side of a house in in, in uptown New Orleans, and the, the old friend of mine, a minister, a preacher, owned it, and Billy came in and we set up in his living room. And he has drums there, and, and we had you know the guitar and the bass. And that's where we met Billy, and we played the songs together. And I remember during the first song, looking across the living room at Caleb and being like, this is it. This is it. And that was right after Travis. So, you know, or that was after we had realized that Travis was, you know, that's what... We hadn't found that since Travis. And that's when, when Billy sat down, we were like, this is the first thought we had given to a drummer. Since since the other drummer had left and Travis had blown us away that night, so so it was, and and then right after that we went on the road literally like, open for Cowboy Mouth like in Monroe, Ruston, Lafayette. Yeah, I think was yeah, the first little tourlet, and you know they definitely gave us a big leg up. You know they, you know Fred obviously was both a fan and you know he had a vested, vested interest. He produced this record for us. Um, the other guys in the band, you know Billy was really good friends with the other guys. Um, and, and Billy was also playing in like five other bands. He in was the city. a very in-demand guy. He was with the Bag Daddies, yeah. um, Chris Pochet's band, really cool. I remember Klezmer, I have Cajun CD. pop record. Yeah, <laughs> That's really. Right. They were a really good band. Um, Swing, and, and was he, was he like, swinging haymakers or? Um, he occasionally sat, sat in with the, the swinging haymakers and the Wild Peyotes, and, and he just uh, played with everybody. And John, he Mary was in John, Pass. yeah, and he was in John Thomas Griffith's right. original solo band before he started uh, joining. He was doing all kinds of stuff. He was that good. And when he joined us, was like, we've got like one of the most yeah. in-demand drummers in town is now in our band. If that wasn't a validation for the both of us too, like we're, we're a grown-up band now. We, we deserve to be on the stage, right. you know, playing with the, the good bands in the region. And I think we got a lot of confidence once Billy joined the band. I think we, we believed in ourselves even more.
the U2 incident. Tell me about that, because I never really understood. It was a it was a blip. You know, I wish it were more dramatic. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> it was. But it, but it's it actually more of a badge yeah, of glory than anything. <laughs> yeah. You go ahead. Um, but you know, in the end of a song on the first record called "The Oath," there is a slight quote of of a line from "Sunday Bloody Sunday." Right. You know, sung somewhat like it. Um, you know what's funny is every article that's ever been written. <laughs> Every article that I've ever read that mentions the oath or the U2 thing, or I mean the, that that line, thinks it's uh, the Beatles. Well, right, well, because see, when I heard, they're referencing uh, right. A Day in the Life. Yeah. When, when and that's I why I never that thought it would be an issue. Sunday, that's what I thought they were referencing. Yeah. So that's why I, I never understood how... And, but t- technically... Because you, know, you said, I want to shut my eyes. Yeah. That was the second part of it. Yeah. But I think that, you know, the settlement that Ichiban made with, you you know, you too, of course, never knew about it. We, of course, wish that they knew about it. it. Bono <laughs> called me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, whoever, they're, the people who watch out for their publishing are the ones who noticed it, um, which at least that means that people were listening to an album I, cut that was never released. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, we, we got sued by you too, and we were like, fucking <laughs> We have made it. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, I mean, I, th- I, I think it was like 1500 bucks and like, 15% of the song yeah. of that one deep oh, that album one cut that yeah. was never released. Yeah, yeah. It was never released as a so song. There's, I mean, they probably made well over $1,600 <laughs> by now, you know? <laughs> but it really was. It was just like, it's not It's not that we got sued for publishing. We were like, you two knows who we are. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my God. Oh, we were thrilled. It was awesome. Badge of honor. That's crazy. So... um, the infamous jazz version of New Age Girl. <laughs> so I, 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 I know, look back on is, that. Is, is it infamous? I, I, to me, it is. Okay. I always, I, it always made me chuckle. I mean, because despite its success, it, it, I know it was a source of frustration as well. Because uh, I'd go to shows and you'd play New Age Girl in the middle of the set, and then half the audience would leave. Yeah. And then if you played it at the end of the set, they'd sit there on their thumbs, and then you play that song, and you'd, the Beatles hit the stage, you know? And to me, I was like, well, didn't you hear all the other stuff they've yeah. been playing? I mean, but I, I've never been one of those people that goes to see a, a band because of one song. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've neither. never been that guy. So I buy, I buy albums yeah. yes. and I listen yes. to albums. I think yes. all three of us do. We're old fashioned yeah, guys. I see threads on, on comment boards and people, there'll be a thread with thousands of pages that says last album you listen to start to finish. And I'm like, are you crazy? Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. Every, I sit at work working on a movie. I will listen to eight or 10 on a 12 hour mm-hmm. day, eight or 12, 10 yeah. albums in a row. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I mean, I might occasionally make like a best of playlist yeah, and playlist listen to that, but it's, mm-hmm. it's a temporary thing. But so, um, you know, how, how was that like to you guys uh, dealing with that? And it's like people were ignoring everything else. Well, uh, first of all, you know, I, I will say that it really depends on the show because there, first of all, in New Orleans, before we got signed, we had started building a following. And by the, by the time we got signed, I think we were drawing about 400 people to the Howlin' Wolf. And New Age Girl was one of the most popular songs, but I don't think it was the most popular song with that crowd. There were a yeah. couple other songs that did... The, the, the cover of Love Me Two Times that we did that was sort of like a real... Hmm. As if the Chili Peppers did it and Mark sang it. Mm-hmm. Always got a huge reaction. Marguerite always did well. Sentimental Crap always did really well. Yeah. Um, Perfect Family always did really well. And with a Spring Love Other Song. So... We were not a one-hit song band before we got signed. And even after we got signed, it depended where we played because, like Mark said, you know, our aim was to be a college band, and we did have, like, you know, three songs that were number one on the college charts for that first record. We go to places where that was a more predominantly college kind of town and play a venue where more college kids went. They knew four or five songs because if you hear three songs you like by a band, you probably, in the 90s, you went and bought that record. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, so Ames, Iowa, those people were screaming for all the songs. You know, okay. Lima, Ohio, still one of the top five songs, I mean, gigs I've ever played for me personally, because we were the Beatles from the first note to the last, as far as they were concerned, because nobody went there. 
They, they learned everybody in that it's audience knew the whole you, record. You own the town when you go to it. <laughs> the one limousine like in the town drove us around. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember in the limousine we were listening to the radio, and they were sightings of the limousine on the way to the record. Yeah, store. it was it was crazy. That, that was just silly. And, and that awesome. was early enough on where we thought this might be the way it's going to be. It was very exciting playing in front of crowds that knew Perfect Family and knew Marguerite and knew Sentimental yeah. Crap, because you know we had nothing against New Age Girl. We liked playing that song. It's a fun song to play. It, it's even now after all that baggage, it is a really fun song to play. It's yeah. high energy. It's still a fun song to listen mm-hmm. to. Yeah, I mean, you know. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It did become this bet noir to us on a certain extent because we just wish that somebody would scream out, you know, the oath or something like that. <laughs> which which is it, yeah. We started play. We started rehearsing last week, I guess. Two and weeks we, ago. And, and we we started playing the oath, and I told Caleb I was like I'd forgotten how just amazingly great this song is. It is so squeezed. It is so Beatles. It's just, it's everything wrapped up in one. And I love Billy's part. I love Caleb's part. I love the bass part. I I mean, the whole thing just comes together. And it's just, it's one of those songs. But talking about the one song versus the album, (coughs) the opposite is what we found when we went to Europe. We went to Spain and people were singing every word to every song in English, and no one spoke English. Yeah, for, so you know, it was, especially in the 90s, Spain had probably the lowest of the Western European countries, the lowest English-speaking percentage. So they were learning it phonetically from listening but to it. Was it was crazy. Well, because they're, they're national, they're sort of like England in that it was a national radio station-based um, culture. There was like a Radio 1 and a Radio 2 and a Radio 3, so we were just getting nonstop play. Like they had their, like old sa- old-fashioned 70s American radio, they had their AOR station that's playing album cuts, and they have their pop station that's playing New Age Girl and I think like Marguerite, because mm-hmm. that those songs were both doing well in Europe. But yeah, we're playing there, and this, under, this underground club, packed with maybe about 400 people, probably fire-coded for 200. <laughs> In fact, and it was so low. We were on the stage. It was only about this high, and I couldn't jump no. <laughs> because I would have knocked myself out with rusty nails above my head. Yeah. Was a- yeah, so it was amazing just to see these people that, I, you know, we had chatted with a few people already, and we'd spent some time in Madrid already that day, and very few people spoke English. And, other, you know, our trans- we had a translator who had to do everything for us and the whole audience, singing along with sentimental crap, which has got somewhat complicated syntax, too. Yeah. And there they are singing. And some crossword puzzle words, too. (laughs) You know, so it was impressive. But it was funny because that whole, what you described shifted as soon as we went to Europe. It became an album in Europe. And, you know, we definitely had like Lyme and we had our spots where people were really into the whole, the whole record. So it wasn't usually the one song and then everyone's going. It was not uncommon for that to happen. But we also always played Drive My Car. We always played Hard Day's Night, or we always played Tax Man. We always did Beatles covers because you can play that anywhere in the world right. and people are going to know it. And I think we were smart enough back then to know you've, you have to pepper it with a few things that people are going to sing along with, you know. So it was, I don't think that really became frustrating until the end of the second album tour because we realized at that point. Ichiban was done. Our record label was done. They had no clue. And God love them. I wish them all the best, but they just didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea how to handle anything beyond the first hit because it got so big so fast and it was ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we're set. We're like, and I remember screaming. We were like, it's been July 4th. Actually, the song has been on the radio since May 10th. And it's now November one single right and dumb and dumber is calling so they're just like no we let it go for another two months and i remember begging them to put out perfect family by the end of the year because we were saying we look you were making us look like we're a one-hit wonder yeah like, like we don't even have an album and by the way everyone's a one-hit wonder right up until their second hit right. so let's go ahead and release a second single and they released it so late and so in, in such a lame fashion they didn't, they didn't you know it. You know, I, I, blame is, is, is useless, but we, I remember in the vans, we were always like, when are they going to release a second single? Because right. it's not helping that this song is one of the biggest songs on earth right now. It's not helping that you're not showing people that there's a second, another, there's more to it, right. you know? Right, if that's all people ever hear, and every, not gonna... 
Every Look single great. night when we're playing a show, we're playing our hearts out, and every song in the set is as important to us as New Age Girl because we want them to realize this is our next single, this is the other single, this is at the end of the album. This is the, the this we used to play anyone every now and then, you know, and it's just so it's. It was it was interesting to watch the record company absolutely lose their bearings, and it became obvious. So at the end of the second tour, we were like, you know, it's now we are officially a one hit wonder. Yeah, and we're done. Scene better a one hit wonder than a no hit blunder. Absolutely. Dad and Russ. Dad and Russ. Yeah, go ahead, bro. So there's this website, I hear it's called MySpace, and there's a third album on there. Is that still still breathing? I actually, I went to the profile today. It is still there. <laughs> so, um, I mean, where'd that album fit in? How, when'd that come in? Um, I remember calling Caleb one day, and this is well after the second record. This 98, is, 99, something like yeah, that. Yeah, we'd been off the road for a year, two years maybe. And I called Caleb one day. I was like, you know... So we have all these songs bef from before, and this references some of the stuff that I found in that book the other day. But I was like, Caleb, we have all these songs that are so great, and they are basically a second version of our first record. Whirl was Cracker, and it was kind of R.E.M. in their Americana stage, and it was the Jayhawks. That was, that's what that record was. But different story is the Beatles, I'm not saying it's the quality. I'm saying it's the approach. You get in there and you bang the shit out of your instruments and you play and you sing your heart out and it's going to come across. And it did. And we had all these songs that were written before that album that we didn't put on. And in my opinion, almost every one of those songs was as good as the first record. So I called Caleb. I was like, you know, these things are just sitting in a dustpan. 
a dustbin. They're unrecorded. They're in our heads. You and I could play them front to back without even rehearsing them. Let's go into the studio and let's just record as many as we can. So we recorded 14, 13 plus Drive My Car. And it was really, it started out as being really kind of a selfish approach because I was like, I wanted to sit and hear these songs again because they were so fun and so awesome. And so we did it. And then we sent that album to a good friend of ours who was Hooting the Blowfish's lawyer. And we sent them the record and he flipped and he was like, oh my God, he's like, this is great. Can I, and, and we said, we'd like to engage you to shop us a deal. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send it out with no name in it and just my contact information. We're gonna see what happens. So we sent it out and everyone he sent to emailed or called back, it wouldn't even really email at that point, but got c contacted him back and said, we love it. We want to sign the band or we want to hear more about it. We want to see them. These, this is fantastic. What a great, breathtaking record. So we scheduled a Mercury Lounge record showcase in New York. And we played and blew the room away. And it was awesome. And then the lawyer followed up saying, this is Dead Eye Dick. Crickets. Oh. Crickets. No one... And, and again, we don't blame them, but it's just like no one wanted to take on New Age Girl 2. They didn't know how to get us out from under the rock that Ichiban had just, or, or that situation. It's not Ichiban's fault, right. but, you know, where we had gotten. And they didn't know how to tell the story. You know, and for those guys, for big corporations particularly, they need a story to tell to market. Right. To be able to market it to radio and to the mass population in general, they need a narrative and they they just cannot write a story that took you from New Age Girl to this record, which um, also didn't really sound like much that was on the radio at the time. You know, in the late 90s, is a lot of new metal is coming out and right. um, these ver and this record, that third record is very ebullient and sparkly and jangly. We wanted to make a very tight pop record like yeah. we did with Different Story. Exactly. We didn't want the big... In fact, I remember telling our engineer, uh, Jim, I told him, I was like, look, what I want on this record, I want really tight drums. And I was like, I'm not talking about head tuning. I'm talking about, I don't want this giant room. I want just I want to just smack you in the head and you hear it once and you don't hit all the reverb behind it. And, and you know, that's what we want. We want this tight, you know, record that, that, that just sounds like a pop record. And he was thrilled because... Everyone at that point was coming in their studio saying, they give me sludge. the John Bonham, give me the Pearl Jam. And we were like, we want the opposite. And I, I would say the only thing we didn't hit a thousand percent on that record are some of the guitar sounds. Because I remember he tweaked a few through the Neve con not you, Jim, our engineer, tweaked a few through the Neve console. And it gave him a little bit of a mid-rangey. Hollow kind of. But other than that, and to tell you the truth, we could go back and stack a couple guitars on it. But other than that, the record sounds almost exactly the way we wanted. Yeah, and, and some again, songs in particular. We did that for really three or four grand, you know, mm -hmm. all in, mastering, mixing, everything. So we basically just went back to square one and said, and I remember calling, I remember calling, I was like, dude, these songs are just too good. I said, maybe no one will ever hear them. But we've got to record them, and we've got to make them sound fun the way we used to, to be, the, the band we used to be. And whatever happens with it happens. But if they just die the death of no one remembering and me just humming in my song when I'm 75 in my head, you know, I'm just like, that's not what I want. Right. And I still, that, that, that album is on my iPod and my iPhone, yes, and it'll come on uh, shuffle, and I'll be like, oh, my God, that's just such a fun song, you know? Yeah. I'm glad it's we on, did it. It's on mine, too. It really is. All three of them are on mine. But I took off the New Age Girl Dervish mix. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that should have been a harbinger. <laughs> there should have been a little clue to us that we were dealing with some, some oddball, yeah. Yeah. maybe clueless types. Because bear in mind, 1994, May of 1994, when they signed us, it was the first time that cool music was popular in a long time, in that the the music that was very popular on college radio was bleeding into the pop charts. And, you know, people like Juliana Hatfield were getting pop hits. Yeah. And, you know, 
who had, she had been an indie darling for years with the Blake Babies and then her own solo stuff. And bands like Belly were on the Johnny Carson show. Yeah, that was wild. Matthew Sweet. Yeah, Matthew Sweet and the enormous. Hit. Yeah. So if you're, you, you got a band that has this somewhat novelty song, don't make it even more of a novelty <laughs> song by playing the, the Munsters <laughs> theme in it. Maybe, oh my God, that's what that, I remember yeah. seeing the Dervish mix, but I don't remember what yeah, it was. Yeah, it, they didn't have a, they really down, didn't understand. Down, 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 maybe down, down, down. it was, you know, I hate to say it, maybe it was because they were both foreign and older. You know, the, the owner, the, the husband of the husband-wife team could give a shit. He was a blues, he had a passionate love for American blues. And that's why he started a record company. His wife was the one with bigger ambitions. But again, she was a middle-aged Finnish lady. I don't think she had any idea about our young popular culture, which, let's face it, if you want a long career, you need to capture the kids, and especially the 18 to 25-year-old hipsters and cool kids who, you know, are tastemakers. But she had no clue about that. <laughs> you remember, remember the first advertising? They were gonna, we had been begging them, put a big ad out, put a big out for the album, not just the song. And so they, they, they mocked up this ad, and I swear to God, it said, Dead Eye Dick, the hot new band everyone's talking about. <laughs> I forgot about that. And I remember, well, I remember we saw that. It was like, we is it like, 1968? We were like, <laughs> oh my, this is where, this is our world. <laughs> we're just kind of like, that just happened. <laughs> yeah, you might as well put full dimension uh, stereo across the top yeah. of your album. And cover. as, as, as. The hot new combo. <laughs> as good as her intent may have been, she also had the worst grasp of American idioms of, of anyone else. My favorite of hers is. Mark, 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 don't, don't worry, darling. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it.
So, so, so her idiom was, don't, don't, don't worry about it, Mark. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> and that's a catch-2020 situation. That was my other favorite. Her other catch-2020. <laughs> catch-20. <laughs> well, I mean, really, if we look at it now, it's a catch-2020 situation. It's like, I think you're... Yeah, never mind. Right. Hindsight <laughs> and catch her in the rye or, you know. Okay, so today was the fourth rehearsal? Yes. Right? One, two, yeah. Okay, so... Two here, two at Fudge, right? So is... is yes. Is becoming a dick again, like getting right back on the bike? Is it like uh This is definitely rust to um, scrape off. For one thing, Mark and I still play music. Right. You know, doing other things. But we don't play these songs. And it has been six years since we played these songs. Um, Billy, I mean, he's, he's the real amazing character in this thing because he doesn't, he doesn't have the chance to play music almost at all. In the six years since we had a reunion, what, he's probably picked up drumsticks two or three times maybe, four or five times. So he doesn't even have the muscle memory of, oh, this is how I play my instrument. At least we, yeah. well, well, to a certain extent, because Mark mostly plays guitar now, so he has to get used to playing the big old thick strings again. Right. Um, but there's definitely rust to scrape off, but even at the first rehearsal here two weeks ago, there were some moments where it felt just as comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, just like, oh yeah. Not as many as now. Like yeah, right. tonight, other than a couple things, felt really good. Yeah. It, yeah, and e even the songs that didn't feel good were like, you know, we're just, we developed very high standards for ourselves when we were playing all the time and got to be a really tight band. So That's the thing. We don't want to just trudge through these. Yeah, we're, right. we're, we're, we're not right. grading ourselves on a curve. You know, we want to sound really good, so we'll be dissatisfied with something that merely sounds, oh, that was okay. That was, nobody will notice. We, we want to sound good tomorrow night. Sure, absolutely, so. yeah. Okay. Well, actually, you sort of got into what I was going to ask next, which was, where are you guys all now? Um, so Billy's not playing music. No, I mean, he'd love to, I think. I think if, if there were a band that could fit into his schedule as a doctor, where he could sit in with somebody occasionally and play, probably his favorite thing would be to play like either country or like Americana or Bruce Springsteen songs. He'd be happy as a clam, you know? But it's just hard for all of us. I mean, I have an actual band, technically, you know, that plays. <laughs> We've played three times this year, my acoustic band, Pony Space, because we're all so damn busy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the girls sings every Monday night at, at the um, the Old Point Bar and hosts a burlesque show every Friday night um, at Irvin Mayfield's Playhouse. The uh, other girl, you know, is in a chorale group and sits in with other singers. And then Craig, the other singer-songwriter, besides having a traveling salesman job, is a trumpet player and second guitar player for Egg Yolk Jubilee. And Mar during Mardi Gras and Super Sunday times, he, he marches, he plays trumpet and marches in different marching groups. I work in the film industry, which, you know, Mark is pulling away from that industry, but he, we can both tell you there's a really long hours, unforgiving schedules, yeah. not really conducive to like band rehearsals and scheduling gigs on weeknights. I get up usually at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> I feel lucky if I get home at 7 in the evening. It's sort of hard. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the stuff I play, we probably play maybe five times a year, but it's all within like three weeks of festival season. Right. You know, Bayou Country Super Fest, Jazz Fest, uh, you know, a couple of things here and there, you know, down in, in uh, Empire or something like that, you know, some 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 benefits, but... Even that, you know, and then literally, like Thomas McDonald texted me, he was like, I'm coming to the show. I was like, dude, you have a night off, stay home. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was like, I never get to see you play with your old band. And, and we only, he's the bass player with, with the other band. He was like, and you know, we only play like four, five, six, seven times a year, maybe. But, and it's for that reason. And, and also, none of us want to get in a van <laughs> and drive around anymore. No, no. Like even if we, it's just we're no. all independently wealthy and didn't have to work. I don't think any of us would want no. to try to be in a touring band anymore. Mm -mm. It would be fun to play more shows. Right. It'd be fun to if have. We could release a record, sell ten, do the REM thing, release a record, sell ten million, and go on a champagne tour. You could coax me onto the bus. Right. But for below, six weeks, maybe. Yeah. Below that. <laughs> Life's just too good. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, those guys, like McCartney can play yeah. Japan and Rio and, and New York because he's got his own jet and, you know, but... Uh, 
big difference. You know, you see these bands, even a band in a bus is not, it's not a glamorous life. And that people don't, they don't see that part of it. I mean, I I did six months in a van. Absolutely. You know, and very little glamour. Yeah, very you know? little glamour. You end up playing poker with the other band in the hotel room and losing and all I, your money. But I will say, you know, like I, I don't regret our decision to eschew the whole tour bus thing in favor of having a van, van because we never the, got a bus. The the loss of glamour, besides the bottom line thing with us having all walking, we we walked away with a lot more of our money than a lot of other bands mm-hmm. in our same circumstance did. Um, yeah, that bus costs about seven thousand dollars a week. Yeah, it's a lot of money. So that's that's the craven that's reason to money, to, you know. to not regret the decision. But also, I think some of that that artificial glamour that you know record companies often insist upon, like we want you to have a four man road crew, we want you to be on a bus. You're gonna you know you're gonna conduct yourselves this way. You're gonna be a little aloof or whatever. I think we can safely say that Mark Billy and I were. For all intents and purposes, ourselves the entire period, we we you know maybe if we would have gotten bitter, bigger, we might have been forced to you know attenuate our personalities one way or another. Although anybody who knows Mark knows he's one of the friendliest people, and is always happy to meet somebody, <laughs> genuinely. Whereas uh, Billy and I could probably be more surly naturally, just like <laughs> oh my god, we've met four hundred people this week. Can we have a break from meeting new people? Right. But Mark is always willing to like oh hey how are you doing I'm Mark and you know remember their name and you know. Genuinely like he genuinely likes meeting people. We would have had to pretend to genuinely. All of us would have had to just say, <laughs> "We we love you. You're our favorite station." And God. that that you know what? If that that's one downside that we sort of avoided eventually by not being as in demand on our second record. Of course, at first we hit a lot of radio stations and tried to work them, but eventually I think we said, you know, nobody's playing the first or second single from Whirl and. You know, we don't now. If we pop in on a if a radio station wants us, we'll just go be ourselves and say, "Yeah, we're playing at the so and so club tonight, and we hope you come out." Yeah, we had New Age Girl, but we're really excited about this record. And then we, you know, play a song or two from Whirl, and thanks a lot. And we just be ourselves. And right, you know, I, I, something just pops in my head. Going this, I think it's the first the first tour, and like you said, every single radio station would say we were the first one to play it. <laughs> every to single one. And they were always the first one to play it. And I remember we were in Chicago, and it was With the Man Cow, Man Cow Show, <laughs> right? Who was the biggest supporter? He loved the us. The nicest guy. I mean, like like you, just loves music and just wants to get good music out there. And he was so nice. And I remember that he, he said he actually was the first one to play us in that entire like three state area. And he's like, you know, I was the first one to jump on y'all. And I remember I. I couldn't help it. I just got that face. And Caleb goes, he actually was. And I remember that moment because I was like, I'm so fucking jaded. We, we've, <laughs> from 99 different radio stations telling me they were the first, we finally meet the one guy who was, you know, and I'm like, yeah, and of course it, yeah, you were. If Mark Miller's getting jaded, you know we are going through some corrosive shit. But he, oh, he, was, a, he was a great guy. He was a wonderful guy. And, you know, he was this, you know, second city version of Howard Stern on the radio. But, yeah, Mark is right. Off radio, he's sitting there talking about the record. He says, oh, you know, that's an amazing record. I love the whole thing. And, you know, I, I really want, you know, when you have another single, you know, we, we'll pump it up. We love you yeah. guys, you know. And he knew the record. He like, knew, yeah. He, he not only just, hey, I love y'all single. It was like, I love yeah, you. You can always album. tell when an artist is in the studio and the DJ is, has no idea. He's just pressing oh, yeah. his buttons. Right. He's doing his thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's do this little thing that I stole from uh, Kevin Pollock. Mm-hmm. And 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 then we'll call it a night. I don't know if you've ever listened to any of his chat shows. Chat, I've, heard, I've heard a little okay. bit of the chat show. You know the the tweet five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, since it doesn't look like you've ever uh, listened to him, I thought you were going actor studio. I was waiting for the blue cards. No. You know, basically, it's 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 a Coke or Pepsi answer. It's two things: no right <laughs> answer, no wrong answer. I'm Paul. Right. Paul, so, not John. We've been through that. <laughs> right. It'd be like that. It'd okay. be something like that. Fair enough. Um, uh, Elvis Costello or Elvis Presley. Presley. Uh, Elvis Costello. I mean, and by... By the way, we're probably going to differ on most of these. A million <laughs> miles. My way as well. <laughs> See, I knew you were a Costello person. That's where the idea for that Which came is up. funny, which is rare, because he is so... Now that I learn more about Elvis Costello, and I remember the first article Keith Spare wrote, he was like, he's like New Orleans version of Elvis Costello. And I was like... Fuck that. <laughs> but it was a compliment, and I understand it was an incredible compliment. I'm the a guy, latecomer to Elvis Costello myself. Because the guy is a yeah. genius, you know. Yeah, he is. 
Um, vegetarians or septuagenarians? Vegetarians. That's obvious. Mark still hadn't answered, so I don't know. I'm going with the octogenarians. <laughs> they can rock it. Music or movies? Music. Yeah, um... I don't know. <laughs> I, I love, I love the cinema. Right. My wife and I go to see a movie almost every week at the theater still, and we watch tons of movies at home as well. Mm-hmm. But if you're telling me one or the other, yeah. music hands down because I don't know if you know. I, I always think of myself as a really well-adjusted guy, but I might be insane because there isn't a moment of silence when there isn't music going through my head. When I go to bed, there's songs playing in my mm-hmm. head, either my own, something I've heard, or something I'm working on, and. It is as much a part of me, even now that I don't play all the time, it's still inside my brain all the time. If, if there isn't music playing, it clicks on in my head. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going with music as well. For, for the reason that, and I came across this a couple of years ago, and, and it, it's kind of a saying that I have in my head, it's like, good music kicks a bad day's ass. And a great Absolutely. movie will take you away for a little while, but it's not necessarily going to change your day. But the worst day, like, Six weeks ago, six months ago, whatever is the worst day I'm listening, and Bruno Mars comes on the radio, who I just freaking love, and I'm like, okay, dude, it's a good day, you know. Or an old Beatles song comes on, or a Cole Porter song. I mean, so yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust to yeah, music. A song can change your mood. I could do yes. without films for sure. Yeah, I would miss them terribly. Yeah, sure, especially you know, I watch this. I watch my favorite movies like I listen to my favorite records. He does. He he watches dozens. My wife 20s, does the same thing. Hundred times. My my wife is like a dude. She quotes movies constantly. She she's constantly frustrated because I was really busy in the eighties, so I didn't see like Top Gun, and she's constantly quoting things from Top Gun. Go oh, shit! You don't know. You <laughs> don't know how funny that was just now in context with the conversation <laughs> right. we're having. How I just burned you. You have no idea. <laughs> And she like she's brilliant. She knows like fifty movies backwards and forwards, and you know we've watched movies before. And she's like saying the lines along with them. Yeah. But to Mark's point, and it's it's one of the most trenchant points he made about a good song can kick a bad day's ass. The day that my ex wife and I, the first day we came back after Katrina, to first time we had a chance to look at our place, as we're driving back to Shreveport after you know. Checking securing out. our place and seeing that you know it wasn't damaged, we were, we were relieved and clean out the fridge. I the first song I put on was uh, um, April, um, April Fools by Rufus Wainwright, mm. and it lifted. You know, I wasn't in a bad mood, but I was in. I was I was sort of emotionally at sea. It was a very confusing because there was no power in our building, so it was sort of like twenty eight days later, a little bit in there, sort of freaky. <laughs> And not the Sandra Bullock one. <laughs> no, I knew what he meant. Not yeah. 28 days. <laughs> but it lifted me right back into like this really great place where I, I was like almost sort of teary with joy because everything was going to be okay. Our, play, yeah, our place right. had been wrecked. And here was this great song. And it was back on, on our way back to our temporary home, but we knew it was going to be temporary and we were coming back. And that song did so much for me. And Mark's right. That, that and, alone. And I think music can do that in about 15 seconds, 10 seconds. The thing I think I like most about going to movies, other than seeing a great movie, is the moment the lights go down before the preview starts. That, to me, is the best part of any movie. But I could totally live without that. If, right. if all music were gone, yeah, my head would explode. There's just, as much as we all have in our heads, you got to add more. Mm-hmm. You know? There all has the to be more. There has to be more. There's something about me. That, that one ran out of space. It wasn't battery. Well, good thing we're finishing up. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer in one word answers now. <laughs> we're the kings of explication. <sighs> All music right. or movies? Uh, yeah, music or movies was the last one. Um, Marguerite or Mary Moon? Marguerite. Marguerite. Because it's a true story, too. Yeah. In fact, the, the line, it cast a spade of dirt, I think of Fred and his mom at, at yeah. her gravesite every time. It's a true story. It's amazing. The lyrics are pretty intense. Written about our old guitar player. Yeah, about his about his, his mother died. His mom died, and he was really close to his mom, and he's sort of estranged from. He lived with his dad, but was estranged from him <laughs> emotionally. Okay, okay. You know, I get it. they they just they occupy the same space, and his dad was half deaf because he worked at the refinery. But Fred had a friendship with his mom that was. You know, he loved his mom like a mother. They didn't have a weird relationship, but they just had a friendship like an easygoing. They could joke around with each other and crack each other up. And when she died, somewhat unexpectedly, right before he got married, 
you know, he and I were pretty good friends. We'd been in two bands together at that point. Um, and he's a really sensitive kind of guy, you know, really, you know, thoughtful, sensitive, emotional guy. But he, I think this really freaked him out. The happiest day of his life was going to happen and a really sad thing happened. And so I just wrote this song about how I thought he felt. Because I knew he wouldn't, I knew he didn't write songs, but also I knew he wasn't going to be able to express it out loud at his wedding. So, let, you know, we actually played that song at his wedding reception. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I remember And he that. said he barely made it through it, but he was really glad we did it. Yeah, Marguerite by a mile. Okay. And then the last one, uh, club shows or festival shows? Club shows. He likes playing outdoors. I like festivals. Okay. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank yeah, y'all for great. doing it. Looking forward to seeing y'all play. Thank you, Rich. Good luck tomorrow. editing. Cool, man. Thanks, Richie. Thanks. Man. Thank you, guys. I like how both front page articles we got refer to her as a sex maniac. I never uh, uh, considered yeah, this. Maniac. Yeah, maniac. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. But the Addison and Keith both was well, like. Well, okay, she likes the bone. I get that. But, but you see, Richie. We've been all over around the world, but you've never been to me. That's, that's I need to spend a little time with me. All right, let's play the stinking song. We're going to do the crash. Yeah.
rockin'.